Good morning. We want to wish you a happy new year. Wow, it's 2021. Hard to believe. Uh, 2020 is a year we probably want to forget in many ways, but it's behind us. God was good in that, and uh, He's in charge here in 2021. So you know that whatever God has in pla- has in store for you and I, it's uh, it's His good plan, and it's going to be accomplishing what He wants for us. Amazing. We're in the book of Revelation. The very God who has given us this book is showing us our future and giving us the confidence and the certainty of our hope in Jesus Christ. He's the same one that that has that future, that has our future in his hands as well. So that's really encouraging. That's confidence inspiring. That's motivation for for all of us as we look ahead to this new year. Uh, Just not knowing what God's going to do, but knowing that he's going to be with us every step of the way. So just take encouragement from that. Be motivated from that and to say, God, my passion is to follow after you this year. And uh, he'll bless that. He'll honor that. Again, we are in the book of Revelation. I'm glad to be here. We're looking at Jesus Christ specifically. He is the one who is transforming history, who is transforming all things. He is working, fulfilling according to the will of his father. He is front and center here in the book of Revelation. And so everything that we see here, everything that we're doing, ultimately points back to Christ. What he's doing, what he will accomplish for his glory, the glory of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's really encouraging. What we see today is we're going to be in chapter 3. We're looking at uh, a specific church. What we're going to see in this church is just this reality that Jesus, he pursues relationship with us. That's really uh, encouraging to us. He never stops doing that. You need to know that. I believe it's going to speak to your heart this morning. So here we are in Revelation chapter 3. He's speaking to a specific church. That church is Laodicea. It's the last of the seven churches. We've, we've gone through the first six. We're taking this, this uh, road in Asia Minor all the way up around the loop and coming back around. We're down at the bottom. And so we are at Laodicea here. Laodicea is of the seven churches in the cities that they're located. It's the wealthiest of the seven cities. It is, it is an absolutely wealthy city. Uh, so many good things have been happening to it financially in that sense. Uh, Laodicea in this time was known for its banks. You know, if you got banks, money's pouring in. And so, so there's power there. There's all kind of things going on here. It's known for its manufacture of a very specific uh, wool, a dye of wool, rare black wool. That's money. If you got something rare like that, that's money. People come from all over. They're seeking that. They're going to pay what, whatever is charged to get that. Laodicea is known for that. They have a medical school there as well, and one of the things in this time that they had invented was a a salve for the eyes. Again, another thing that is sought after in the temples and just worship of gods, gods, Roman, Greek gods, and uh, just money pouring in. So Laodicea was uh, well off. That's kind of the the scene that we have here, and we see this. Uh, It was located near a, a place called Hierapolis that was known for its hot springs, and then it was also known, it was located near Colossae, which was known for its re- really refreshing cold water. So you have, the, you have the distinction there. You have the opposites there, and you have Laodicea. We're going to see that come into play. Everything that the, we see here about Laodicea ultimately comes into play as Jesus speaks to this church. Remember, as he's speaking to the church, what he's doing is he's speaking to the church. This is the church age, chapter 2, chapter 3. We are in the church age. He's speaking to the churches that were there then, to this very specific church, and his message is for you and I today as well. We are part of the church. We are here until Jesus comes and the rapture occurs and takes his church into heaven to be with him. This is who he's speaking to. So this message is very much is for us and for all believers. So what Jesus does with all the seven churches He specifies that church, targets that church, and then he says, I want to examine who you are, what's going on in your church. I want to reveal to you the true nature of who you are. And that's what he does. He speaks into our life and the Word of God. When we read it, it reveals the true nature of who we are. If we're honest with the Scriptures, we begin to see ourselves in the Word of God and the ways that we need to conform to the image of Christ and change. So he's examining this church, and and he uses this phrase, I know in verse uh, 15, we see that, I know your works. He's used that phrase uh, many times of the seven verses, not this exact phrasing in every church, but he does say, with omniscience, I know you. I know everything about you. What is it that he sees? 
Well, the key dis- the key distinction of this church is one that we are very familiar with. If you if you know this church and the seven churches at all, he says that what I know about this church, what I see in this church is that you are you are lukewarm. Verse fifteen and sixteen. I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you would either were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spew you. I will spit you out of my mouth. We're going to see that here. This church here is defined by a quality. They're not hot. They're not cold. There's no fervor for Christ. No, no passion for Christ. There's no passion for one another. One another's of ministry serving one another. There's no passion for those who are lost. There, there, is, there is a lukewarm quality here. We're going to develop that. We're going to see that. That's one of the things. This is a rebuke to the church. As he defines the church, he says the tone of the church is this. There's no fire for Christ. Uh, There's no purpose that the church is accomplishing for Christ. We're going to see that very clearly. What he rebukes them for is how they view themselves. You say this about yourself. In verse 17, he says this. You say, I am rich. I have prospered. And I need nothing. As they look at themselves, they equate their church with who they are in Laodicea. They equate their spirituality with the material things that they have in their life, with the prosperity that they have in their life, with the, with the income that they have coming in, the paycheck that they have coming into their life, maybe the size of the church and the, and the, and the, um, the riches that they have in the church, the, the budget that they have. Um, they, they view themselves as a people, as a church. I really don't need anything. I've really got what I need. I've, I've got it made. I'm doing well. Our church is doing well. We're okay. And so he rebukes them for, for not having an honest assessment of who they are. Because this is what God says. He says, we're going to see that here in a second. This is in contrast what Laodicea sees in contrast to Smyrna. In chapter 2, verse 9, Smyrna, they looked at themselves and God says, you are poor. You're poor. But the reality is, you're not really poor. You're poor materially, but the reality is you are, you are rich in Christ and in relationship and in what God is doing. What a contrast here to the church in Laodicea. That's important to see. And so the reality is this. They're in a lifestyle that they're content with, but God's not. The problem comes in our lives when we are content with who we are without a, re- a reference to, without the grid of the Word of God being applied to our life. We define ourselves by qualities that are not God's heart. We define ourselves by things that are in our life, but not by relationship with Jesus Christ. And so God is rejecting how they are defining their life. He rejects the conclusion that they come to. And how many times does that happen in the lives of believers? We define ourselves by who we are, by our job, by our money, by our income, by our church, how big it is, what the programs that it has, all these things. God says, I look at your life. I define your life differently. I define your life by relationship to me. And so Jesus says here in verse 17, he continues, and he says, you don't realize that you are wretched, you are pitiable, you are poor, you are blind, you are naked. Uh, you're, you're miserable people. You're miserable ultimately in your hearts. Whatever, whatever is, is, has been poured into your life as, as general blessing from God, you have misused that. You're pursuing everything that the city offers, that the, that the region offers, and it's not giving to you what it promises. Satan always promises, never fulfills. And so we have a group of people here that are content, but they don't realize that it will be empty in their life if that's what they pursue. They're in need of mercy. They're pitiable. Uh, they are in need of God's mercy. They don't see it. They don't understand it. So Jesus says, this is who you are. When he looks into our life, the word of God may speak into our life and, and reveal to us that what we think is, is blessing and what we think is favor, what we think is success, is man-made, is of our own doing, has nothing to do with the fruit of Christ in our life and of relationship with Christ and of identity in Christ. That's what Laodicea is guilty of. That's what we see. So Jesus says, this is, these are the steps that you need to take. This is the path that you, that you must go on. Here's the course of action that you need to take in your life and your church. If things are going to change in, in, in regards to your relationship with me, 
then relationship has to change. Well, he says that. In verse 15, he says this. The first thing that you need to do as a church, you need to be useful. You need to be useful for me. Would that you were hot or cold. Again, we mentioned Hierophilus and Colossae at the beginning. Hierophilus was known for its hot springs. People came from all over to enjoy those. There's places here in America and around the world where we have those same qualities. Colossae was known for its fresh water springs. It was cold water, it was pure water. You know, a bottled water is a, is a whole industry now. It was refreshing. By the time those sources of water came to Colossae, they would be, they would be, they would be lukewarm. They wouldn't be what, what anyone wants. Um, and he says to them, you need to be useful. Hot and cold can be, can be negative. We can be cold. We can not be responsive to the Lord. But hot and cold in this context, I believe, some commentators see this as a negative, as cold as being a negative. I don't. Because contextually and, and with these cities in mind and with the reality in mind, cold here in this context is good, it's useful. Uh, hot is good and useful. That's, that's what you want. You know, when, when you go to a restaurant, uh, they're always topping off your, your coffee. You want hot coffee, right? That's, if you drink coffee, you want hot coffee, most people. Or if you drink tea, iced tea, they're always giving you more tea, adding more ice. You want cold iced tea, most people. There's a purpose. That's what we want. God says every believer has a purpose. Or to be hot or cold in the positive sense of the word. Hierophilus, Colossae. They, cold was refreshing in the summer. Uh, the hot water was refreshing in the, in, the, uh, in the winter. They had purposes that were very specific, and people came from all over to enjoy that. He says you need to, be, you need to choose to be used of God. You are, a, you are a vessel in God's hands. You have forgotten that you have purpose and use in God's hand. Another course of action is you need to be real. Verse 17, he says you don't realize. You don't realize your real spiritual condition. How many believers are, are walking a walk that is, that is away from the Lord? How many believers are, are, have wandered away from the faith, have wandered away from faithfulness with the community of Christ at church? How many believers have wandered away from, the, from relationship in Christ and the disciplines of the faith, of, of following after Jesus Christ? Jesus says, you don't realize, you don't realize that when those things are true of, of our life, that, that we are in a, in a position of great need before the Lord of repentance and of turning to the Lord. He says in verse 18 as well. Let's look at verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Another course of action that he tells them to take. He says you need to be useful. You need to be, you need to be real in your life and you need to be willing. You need to be willing for God to refine you. You need to be willing for God to to clothe you with righteousness. In other words, you need to be willing to do the right thing before God. Whenever we obey God, when we do the right thing, we are in that day and in that moment, we are clothed with righteousness. Before Him, we are clothed in, in a manner of living that pleases Him. And we are to be discerning. We are to be discerning in our life. When that salve is applied, there is healing that takes place in the eyes and, and we can see with clarity we are to have a spiritual discernment. We are, to, we, are, we are to see the culture around us, decisions and choices around us from a biblical worldview. We're to have the discernment of the Word of God in our life. He says you need to be willing to be refined by God. <clears throat> that is important. We need to be willing to come to this place. Lord, change me. Lord, change me. We need to be willing to pay whatever the cost is to, to accept the price for real gold. The real gold is what God supplies. The real gold is what God blesses us with. The real gold is, is the reward of relationship with Christ and of eternal reward. The real gold, real gold is what God does in our life. The real treasure in your life and mine is what God does and how he uses your life. He says to you and he says to the believers and he says to me, he says, we need to, be, we need to be, willing, be willing to go through a process 
of hardship, of, of adversity, of faithfulness in our walk with the Lord, so that ultimately at the end of the day, we can reap a treasure that is eternal. We can reap a treasure that is reflective that Jesus Christ has transformed and been working in our life. In verse 19, he says this, Those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline, so be zealous and repent. We need to be willing to repent. Jesus loves us. He loves us as his children. He loves the church here at Laodicea. He commends Laodicea for nothing. It is only a rebuke to them. And yet within that rebuke is grace. There are times when Jesus needs to rebuke us because what is in our life at the moment is a pattern of sin, willful sin, rebellion, disobedience. That's the believers here. We need to be willing to accept that loving discipline of Jesus Christ in our life. We're going to see that. And we need to be responsive to him. Look at verse 20. And in verse 20, he says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. We need to be responsive to Christ. To, to, uh, to hear him, to open the door when we hear his voice, and to welcome him in. We're going we're gonna to see this further. These are the courses of actions. These are the steps that God would have you and I to take. When we have wandered from the Lord, when our heart is not where it should be, when sin defines us, when we are captivated by everything else in our life, all that Columbus offers, everything that's available to us at our fingertips, have a job, have income, have entertainment opportunities, have friends, have all these things, when those things captivate us instead of Christ, we need to be responsive to the work of Christ, to the, to the voice of the Lord, the touch of the Lord in our heart, and be drawn back to Him. In all these things that we just mentioned, the key, the key to the churches is the Lord always says, here's my call to you. Now, here's how I'm going to help you. I love that. That really is the key to all of these seven passages, all of these seven churches. Jesus reminds all of us who are children of God, you're not alone. What I ask you to do, I will enable you to do. I will give you the strength to do it. You must, and I must simply yield and be willing to follow and to obey, to be used of God. The Holy Spirit is so crucial, that first element. Am I listening to the Holy Spirit? Am I obeying the Word of God that He prompts in my life? Every week we've been looking at this. He is speaking to you every week. He is speaking to you every day from people in your life. And should you be faithful from the Word of God in your life? And then Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is, is the focus. He's the focal point here of Revelation. He is the one who enables it in our life. Let's see how he does it in this passage. Well, in verse 14, as we begin this section, I always, I always go back to that because that's the key here. Verse 14, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, and the beginning of God's creation. Here's how God enables us. He says, I am your amen. So be it. When we say amen, we're saying, we're saying, God, so be it. He is the one who is the final authority, the final voice, the final mover and shaker of history of our lives. He is the amen. What he declares with certainty is going to take place. His word is true. His word is binding in our life. It will accomplish what he intends. His truth is, it's guaranteed because of his character. His character is the stamp of authority and certainty on the promises of God. 2 Corinthians 1.20 All the promises of God find their yes in him. Every promise ever written in the scriptures will be fulfilled and find their promise in God, in Jesus Christ. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God. God, so be it. You do as you've promised in my life 
and in history for your glory. That's what it's all about. He is also faithful and true. He is able to enable you and I to be faithful and true just as He is. That speaks simply to the reliability of His character and His Word. What He says, He will do. What He said, He has done. That's, that's so key. His character is in direct contrast to the character of the Laodiceans here. He's speaking to them. He's telling them about their spiritual condition. Many of them, most of them are not going to listen. They're not going to hear. They're not going to believe. They're not going to receive and follow in obedience. They're going to do it their own way. Here's Jesus. Revelation. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. That's when he returns, the second coming. And in righteousness he judges and he makes war. In chapter 21, he who was seated now on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. That's his character. You can believe him. You can believe him. Why did Jesus come to earth? Well, there's a lot of answers to that question. One of the answers that Jesus gave ties directly to this. When he, when he answered a question that Pilate asked him, this is what Jesus says. Are you a king? For this purpose I was born. For this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. That's Christ being faithful and true. That's you and I responding in faith, being faithful and true, and drawing others to Christ because of that. That's why it's so important that you and I walk in faithfulness. That others who need the Lord can see the truth of the gospel in our life, in our testimony, in our witness, in our faithfulness. It is about us being reflecting that we are faithful, we are true, as Christ is, as he was. And he says, I am your creator, the creator of all things. He says here in verse 14, I am the beginning of God's creation. Don't let, when, it, when John says he's the beginning of God's creation, don't let that trip you up. He's not saying here that Jesus was created. The Word of God speaks clearly to that. We're going to see that. Okay? Three places that we see here. John 1, 3, Colossians 1, 16 and 17, Revelation 22, 13. We could go to a lot of places. Just reminders here. All things were made through Christ. Everything was made through Christ. Whatever was made, whatever was created, was made through Christ. All things were created for Him. He is before everything that was created, which means He was never created. He was the creator of all things. He has always been. He is eternal. Everything that has ever been created, He was before that. Clearly it says that from the Word of God. Revelation 22, And I am the Alpha and the, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. When the beginning began in history, I was already there. In the beginning, God, Genesis 1.1. Jesus was there. When the beginning began, Jesus was already there. Before history began, eternity was, Jesus was there. He is our creator. He made you. He loves you. He is authority over your life. He gives you and I life every day. If he created this world, he created us. He made us. He formed us. He fashioned us. Psalm 139. Then to him we owe our lives. To him we owe our allegiance. He says to the church, I am the final word. I am your creator. I am faithful. I am true. Now, to every church, he leaves his word of promise. What are these promises? Well, what we see here is this. He deals with sin. That's a promise. He deals with sin in our life. He deals with sin here in the life of Laodicea, in the life of these other churches, the life of his church, in your life and mine, because he cares. Verse 16, he clearly says, because you're lukewarm, neither hot or cold, you're not useful. You're not useful in the moment for me. You're not someone I can use. You're not a vessel that's clean. You're not a vessel that's surrendered, yielded, and willing. You're not useful to me. Because that's true, I will spew you. I will spit you out of my mouth. When I encounter, when I encounter your work, 
it will be disgusting to me. I will spew it out of my mouth. That's what he says here. When he, how many believers, how many times does he encounter our life? And in the course of one day, just one day, does he have to spew out of his mouth the experiences, the choices, the responses, the goals, the motivations that we have done just in one day? He says to the church, I will spew you out of my mouth. There's nothing there that's good, that's appetizing, that's pleasing from your life to me. Well, I don't want that said of me. You don't want that said of you. But there's nothing in my life that every day I'm guilty of something that is a dishonor. Yes, we are sinners. And yes, we sin every day. But we have the opportunity to confess, to be right with the Lord, to yield to Him before we walk into sin, to overcome, to be victorious, to honor Him, to please Him. That's what He desires. In Ephesus, He said to Ephesus, the first church, you don't love me anymore like you used to. If that doesn't change, I'm going to take your lampstand from you. That's dealing with sin. We see that with this church is here. He has said and he promises to deal with the sin. But verse 19 makes it clear. He says, I love you so much. Those that I love, I reprove and I discipline. It is, it is an ultimate act of, of Jesus Christ. Yes, when he went to the cross and he gave his life. But it's also an ultimate act of love when he disciplines you and I. He is saying to you and I, He loves He loves you. He loves me so much. But He does the work in my heart to draw me back. Simply put, He hates sin. Just, just to illustrate from Proverbs, He hates pride, haughty eyes. He hates it when we're just, when there was a pride in our life. When we feel self-sufficient and we can do it on our own. He hates it when, there, when we have a lying tongue. tongue. We're lying to others. We lie to ourselves. We're not honest with ourselves. He hates that. He hates it when our hands are shed innocent blood. When we, when we hurt innocent people. When we hurt people without cause. He hates that. He hates it when our heart devises wicked plans. He hates it when we are intentional about sin. He hates it when we intentionally stay away from Him. He hates it when, we, when, we, when our feet are swift to run to evil. He hates it when we plan to do evil and then we run to it. He hates it when the intent and motivation of our heart is to stay away and to do things our own way. He hates that. It's an abomination to him. He hates it when we are a false witness. Not only are we lying now to others about ourselves and lying to ourselves about who we are, now we're lying about other people. We're hurting other people. We're using truth and misusing it. We're, we're stating lies and we're hurting people. He hates that. He hates it. And he hates it when we spread discord. These are just some of the things God hates in our life. Not just the big sins that we think of. It is sin in general that captivates our heart. And so we need to embrace the correction of God in our life. My son, do not, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Don't be weary of his report, his reproof. The Lord reproves those that he loves. The first law of dynamics says this, energy cannot be created. All the energy that, that, that is has always been. We can't create more energy. We can't destroy the energy. What we have, all the energy in the universe is constant. It moves, shifts, but it's constant. We can't create more. We can't destroy it. The second law of thermodynamics is what I want to look at. It's, it relates to this passage here. The first part of that law says this. As energy is transformed, as it's transferred, as it's moving, functioning, a lot of it is wasted. Not destroyed, wasted. Not used for the purpose for which it was intended, right? But there's a second element of this law of second uh, thermodynamics. It states there's a natural tendency of any system that is isolated or closed to, to degenerate into, into a, a, a disorder in our lives, uh, in the universe, energy that that's not receiving a drawing from something else is, is going to start creating, developing problems within its internal system. Because it's isolated, because it's closed, the result is a dwindling supply of energy. That's what leads to disorder. 
This is the second law of ther thermodynamics. Because no more energy is being produced, unless something is added, energy, unless something is added from the outside, then the system itself is going to decay, it's going to die. It's going to die. Everything needs to have a source of energy. We see where this is going, don't you? You, you see the law, the natural laws that surround us. Boy, how, how they reflect the spiritual realities of life as well. Jesus says in John 15, I am the vine. You, you and me, we, you, we are the branch. We need to abide in him. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, is, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you and I can do nothing. When we are living life as Laodicea is, when we are living life without drawing upon the energy of Christ, without drawing upon his values into our life, when we are wandering from the Lord and not feeding on his word, then, then our energy begins to wane. Our energy supply grows lower and lower and lower. What takes place when we are away from the Lord, not drawing from his energy and his power, is our supply grows weaker and weaker and weaker. The result is disorder comes into our life. Chaos comes into our life. How many Christians have disorder in their life, have relations, relationships that are exploding in their life constantly? Have, have a lack of, of peace in their life, have, have mental, spiritual, emotional issues that are not being resolved biblically. It's because, it's because the life blood, the abundant life of Jesus Christ is not being poured into our life. Our supply, our resources, our wisdom, our ability grows weaker, weaker, weaker. We're depleted. We don't have the answers for our life, but we think we do. That's Laodicea. They're content in their, in their material wealth. They are bankrupt in the sense of active relationship with Jesus Christ. Want power to overcome in your life and mine? Give God your heart. That's, that's the first step. Want what God wants. Value what He values. Plug into His power. Make, be intentional. Plugging in to a relationship with Jesus Christ, into the Word of God, listening to the Spirit of God, applying that in our life. Giving God your words, our words, uh, making, using our words well, have, making good choices, uh, following through on actions in our life, attitudes that are pleasing to Him, establishing habits. See, that's what happens. Decisions become habits. Establishing habits that honor God. Letting God develop His character in, in my life, in my heart. That's the result. That's what begins to take place as these things happen. And then, and then ultimately, I'm defined as being an overcomer in the strength of relationship with Jesus Christ, in the strength of his hope that he shows me from his word here in Revelation. These are the things that defines and enables my ability to be an overcomer. This is, this is the energy, the power, the grace of God being poured into my life, and I am a willing, receptive, receptacle, a vessel for Jesus Christ. I let him have his way. I fail when I follow my own heart. When I ignore this first step, then I just pursue what I want, when I want it, how I want it. I follow my own heart. That's what our culture teaches. It's a failure. You, it will fail your life. You will fail when that is the way you live your life. Laodiceans are following their own heart. They are content with what they have. We fail when we, when we decide to do it our own way. When everything that comes out of our life is a reflection that we're doing in our own way. Our words, our actions, our choices. We hurt people. We hurt ourselves. It leads us to spiritual dead ends. It doesn't accomplish God's purpose in our life, and we're empty, 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 empty. We fail when we develop bad habits. When we continually reinforce these, these poor choices, poor, poor word usages in our life against others, our family, our friends, our neighbors. We fail when Christ is not charging me, when he's, when he's not changing me. He's not coming into my life. I'm not letting him change me. Relationship is all about, Lord, change me. I fail when I don't let that happen. And I fail when I lack the strength of the Lord. I fail when I lack his vision, when I, when I fail to see his hope, his promise, his certainty. So we have a choice to make. We're going to see a little bit negative here. It's positive, but let's look at this. Luke, Matthew, and Revelation. The disciples on the road to Emmaus. Did our hearts not burn within us when we were with the Lord and, they, and he opened the scriptures to us? There's a fire for Christ. See, that's what he wants us to have. He wants us to have that fire here. I hear lawlessness in our life, and we're walking away from the Lord. Then, then we grow cold with Jesus Christ. This is a negative connotation. In the text here, I believe it's absolutely positive, hot, cold. 
And the scripture is called is often used in a very negative connotation. That's where this comes from. And he says here in this passage, we're not to be lukewarm. We are to be useful for the Lord. He wants you to be useful. How many believers are not useful for the Lord? How many believers are not useful in their church? They come to church for an hour. They receive and they leave. They never give. They never serve. They're not useful in their church. They've not taken on ownership in the, within the community of Jesus Christ for the sake of Jesus Christ. They're not active, faithful, and serving for Jesus Christ. So that's what this is all about. What's the second promise? This is so key. This is what this passage ultimately is all about. He pursues you. He pursues us. That's what he's driving at here. Who? The repentant believer. He pursues us. He's standing at the door, and he's knocking. This ultimately is not a call, ultimately, first and foremost, to unbelievers. In this passage, he's speaking to the church. He's speaking to believers here who have simply set Christ aside in their life, and they're doing it their own way. What's he doing? Faithfully. Daily. Constantly. Through the Spirit of God. The Word of God. People in your life. He's knocking. He's knocking. He's doing it lovingly. He's doing it patiently. Why is that? Because he wants communion with you. He wants fellowship with you. He wants to use you. He wants to use your life. He wants you to know the blessing of a relationship. He wants you to function for the purpose for which you were designed. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. He's calling you and I to that. He's calling us to fellowship with him. Ultimately here, it's an, it's an evidence of his love. He's, as he knocks, as he's trying to get your con attention and conviction, with that knock, he's saying to you, I love you. I love you. As he disciplines, he says, I love you. That's what he's doing here. He's pursuing. With adversity, he's pursuing. As he knocks, convicts, he's pursuing. He's pursuing you. When you feel the heat of God coming into your life, know that he's pursuing you because he loves you. He wants to draw you and I back to him. He calls us to welcome him. Joshua was called to choose. Joshua called the people. You need to choose today. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve the gods that your parents always did, your dad? Are you going to serve the gods that are in this land? Are you going to follow the culture? Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve? To me, I'm going to serve the Lord. Today, I'm going to serve the Lord. Me, my family, my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He counsels us. He says, I will counsel you with my eye. I will instruct you. I will teach you. He lovingly does that. That's what he does. Third promise. He says to the overcomer, I will give you privilege. I will give you authority. Verse 21. He says, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my Father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He says, I will grant you, every believer, the right, the privilege, the opportunity to sit on my throne to serve with me, as I've done the same thing. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. I don't, I don't fully know what that means. I don't know what that means. What's that service going to look like? Who is going to actually be on there? The faithful believer, in some way, shape, or form, we're going to all be giving opportunities to serve him. It'll be a privilege. It'll be an honor. It'll be authority. It will reflect our faithfulness here. The role I believe we are given in heaven. Everything that we receive in heaven will be beyond comprehension. It will be good beyond comprehension. The privilege in heaven, opportunity in heaven, authority in heaven, I believe will reflect how well we have served him here. If we've not served him faithfully and well, then that privilege and authority will be less. Oh yes, heaven will be as pure and sweet to you, to that person, to the one who is faithful, as to all. But opportunity will be different. Maybe specifically in the millennial kingdom, I don't know. Our life is to be motivated by Christ. He's coming again. He's pursuing us. Every day, God's grace is being extended into your life. That's what he's doing. So we need, to, we need to choose. Am I going to receive the strength of his grace in my life or am I going to turn a deaf ear to it? He is talking to you every day. Every day he's talking to you. Whether you hear his voice or not, he's seeking to get your attention. He's pursuing you because he loves you so much. He wants to use you. And so we have a choice to make today. You and I have to choose wisely. What are we going to do? We have to choose wisely. 
This is the heart that God wants from you and I this morning. Jeremiah 24, 7. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord. They shall be my people and I will be their God. For they shall return to me with their whole heart. This is, this is, a, this is a verse, this is a call, this is a challenge he is giving to the believers in Laodicea. He says, he says I, want, I want your heart. I want from your heart. I want to see this, that I'm your Lord, that I'm your God. I want to see you love me with your whole heart. I want you to know that you are my people. You belong to me. He wants, he wants me to acknowledge, God, you are my God. I'm, I'm, I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm your servant. I'm here to serve you. He wants the believers here to return to him. He wants the believers here to give their whole heart to him. He wants the believers in Laodicea to quit living for success in Laodicea. He wants the believers to start living for success before the Lord. He wants them to set, to, to set aside, to take off those things, those heavy weights, those sins that have failed them, beset them, held them back, been chains in their life. He wants, he wants every believer to set those things aside and to be freed in Christ, to have those things released, to be able to be an overcomer, to follow after Christ with a passion, with a fervor, with a, with a heat of fervor, to be hot and to be cold in the positive sense, to be useful for the Lord. Cold, refreshing water, hot streams that are refreshing. Not cold that's away from the Lord, cold that's apathetic. And that's not what he's talking about here in, in this passage. He wants you and I. Simply this, he wants our heart. He wants to lay out to see it to return to him. He wants to fellowship with them, to commune with them. If they don't, then they will face, you and I will face, the ultimate rebuke of Christ. We are still children of God, but none of us want to face a holy God and not have served Him well. None of us want to face the Lord and not have been faithful to Him. We want to, we want to face the Lord. We want to hear Him say, I want you to want this. He wants you to want this, to hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the challenge from Leo to see you today. Listen to his heart. He is speaking to you. If sin has gripped your life, if sin has a stronghold in your life, if you've wandered from Christ, if there's unfaithfulness in your walk before the Lord, if you have given your life to, every, to pursuing everything else, but you never pursue him, he wants to call you away from that sin call you back to repentance, call you back into relationship, and He will pursue you. He will discipline you. He will bring adversity into your life because He loves you so much. He wants to surround you with His healing, loving grace. He wants to give you the power of His loving grace every day. May you and I respond to that, receive that, and be useful for the Lord. Lord, change me. Lord, use me. Help me not to be like the believers here in Laodicea. But help me to be responsive to you as you're knocking. Lord, I welcome, I welcome you today into my life, into everything that's a part of my day today. This morning, I welcome you in. God, I want you to have your way in my life and through my life. Change me so that that happens, I pray. That should be our prayer. And so we just say in Jesus' name, amen. So be it. May we leave that commitment before the Lord this morning. Lord, do that, we pray this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining with us. What a delight. We'll come back and we'll see you again next week.